it's, it's such an honor uh, uh, to be recognized uh, uh, by the uh, ILRF uh, and, and, and what's been created here all, all these many years and to be able to have them as part of this battle uh, in Bangladesh uh, in terms of my most recent involvement, but to have them at the side of so many workers looking and seeking justice and finding it, finding the support and, and to have their uh, support means so much. And to be uh, honored in the same evening as, as CWA and, and, uh, and Larry Cohn, uh, he's my fix. When things just go to hell, I say, I need a beer really quickly, and I need a beer with you. And, and, uh, and we can come up with five schemes and one beer, and then we're done. Yeah. We got He's busy, I'm busy, but we got our schemes. We got our, we got our schemes going here. And uh, uh, it, it's, it's just it's magnificent. He has a vision of where this can go uh, and the importance of uh, crossing these borders and getting alliances, even more important today than ever, uh, if we're going to, if we're going to uh, get people uh, decent and livable wages uh, uh, because no longer uh, can we believe that that just impacts them, it impacts us. And we're seeing that every day uh, in the great debate over inequality and uh, of people's ability uh, to provide for themselves and, and for, their, for their family. And to Eva Argueta, uh, it's, it's just incredible what, what they're able to achieve uh, in, uh, in Honduras uh, and to get this kind of agreement uh, you read this agreement and you think, how could this have happened? Because we, we, it's so difficult everywhere else. It must have been so easy for you to do this. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> how did you do <laughs> But uh, it wasn't. It wasn't. It was about courage, and it was about vision, uh, and it was about persistence. And uh, uh, if you look at the slideshow here, all of these people have demonstrated remarkable courage. I do it from the position of a member of the United States Congress. Uh, uh, and that just makes it one hell of a lot easier and safer. And I meet every day uh, people who demonstrate courage. And I ask myself all the time after the meeting, would I be able to do that? Could I do that? Would I be there? And it's a tough test when you see the environment that these women are working in. I had the honor a couple of weeks, uh, a month ago to go on, on the, uh, the, the, the uh, Faith and Politics uh, uh, Freedom Summer, Memorialization of Freedom Summer. Uh, and as we listened to my colleagues in Congress who participated, John Lewis and Eleanor Holmes Norton, talking about walking through the night in, in rural Mississippi, I asked myself, would I have had the courage? Would I have left uh, Yale Law School and gone down to, to register people? and to know the violence that was perpetrated on them, their friends, and others uh, who were associated with them. And uh, you'll find that it's, it, 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 for me, it, it's, uh, uh, it's remarkable to see what, what uh, those women, the courage that they've had in Bangladesh, even just to go to work takes courage. But then to think about organizing, thinking about helping your fellow worker. Because if you've, if you've gone through these factories, you'll understand they're designed so you only look in one place. And it's very interesting. When the factory owners are bringing dignitaries to the factory, the workers don't look up. Because there's a disconnect between the owners and the supervisors. And looking up is harmful to your... So you just keep working. But it's set up that way. And, and as you walk through, you have to think about what it would mean if this woman decided that she wanted to speak out, if she wanted to insist that she get all of her overtime pay, if she wanted to insist that they don't steal her maternity time, if she wanted to insist that they don't violate her physically, if they, she wanted to insist that she was entitled to a decent wage, if she wanted to insist that somebody was sick at home and she may have to take a moment off. All of those are incredibly courageous acts. All of those are. And it's, it's, it's just remarkable to be associated with, uh, uh, with these individuals. To, uh, 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 and, uh, you know, that's my reward. I've met the most remarkable people, the most courageous people, over 40 years, who have struggled on and on, with or without 
my assistance, with or without the assistance of the United States, with or without the assistance of human rights organizations, because they knew that they had to. And uh, it's great to see Nomita here and to understand uh, that, uh, that struggle and that, that she continues today. And uh, Kalpurna, who's in the, in the slideshow here, is just a remarkable organizer to meet the new organizers of the new unions. It's a little bit of an overstatement to say new unions. There's, there's an organization there and they don't have a lot of rights. But to see the enthusiasm of these young women and some young men and to see them talk to their coworkers and to see their list of not grievances, things that they should be corrected. They're in no position to get confrontational in their first meeting, but they're making changes. And some factory owners are responding to that. But to see the courage of them to come into that room and to meet with us uh, is, 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 is just something, something else. So um, uh, it's been a great run. Uh, I have changed to this industry all over the world for 40 years. It tells you how effective I am. Um, <laughs> but I think, I think because of the help of all of you in this room and the conference today and Judy's work and the AFL and so many of the, the human rights organizations and the women's organizations, I think we're getting a very fundamental understanding of what this struggle is about. And it's really about whether or not a huge, huge industry in, that's worldwide, the garment industry, the ready-made industry, whether or not they can have as the foundation of their success a system that's built upon the violence against women, that's constructed on the violence against women. The economic, the physical, and the sexual violence against women is how this industry is organized. The brands don't want to take ownership, they own it. They designed it. I've watched them design it all these many years. I've watched them design all of the escape routes when something goes wrong in one country. I've watched their deniability that that really wasn't their contract. No, that wasn't their contract. It was their middleman who had a separate contract to put it into that factory. Well, they didn't know the middleman was going to do that. Some of the smartest, most talented corporate people in the world all of a sudden get really stupid when it comes to responsibility. They don't know anything. They don't know anything. That's just unacceptable in this day and age. But that's the struggle. And we're led by very courageous people. And so when you think about today, when you're passing that jar with dough in the jar, maybe you can help out. Those of you who have, I thank you so much. Because this is the epicenter of this effort. We hope to build on it. We hope to expand it. And, and we've got a lot of allies in other parts of the, uh, of the world. But this is, this, is, this, is a global, this is a global effort. And the, and the, the whole industry is constructed on being able to move and to get out of the limelight as fast as it happened uh, when, when, when it's called into question. And, uh, you know, Students Against Sweatshop, I remember when I went into one really scary night in Puebla, Mexico, and uh, I had to meet with the mayor of the town to explain to him that it was no longer his union. Uh, the union was going to be given to the workers, to these magnificent women who came from rural Mexico outside of Puebla where I went and met with them uh, around a campfire in the remnants of an old hacienda with, with the family chapel still in the, in the village, about as rural as you could get. And that these women were taken by bus into the factory and then brought home at night. And uh, they said enough was enough. They said, we're not going to eat this rancid food anymore. We're gonna, not going to let these minders, if you will, who were brought in by, at that time, Nike, who physically abused them with sticks and beat them and beat them and beat them. They said, no more. And students for sweatshops stepped in. This is a very profitable garment they were making for the universities. This says Alabama, says Harvard, you know, these are, this, this, is, this is the creme de creme. And when the students stepped in and said, no, we don't want that in our bookstores. We don't want our name associated with it. It changed the world. It changed the world. And these women in Puebla were organized. I remember thinking when I went there, I said, Jesus, this looks like a McGovern headquarters or something. <laughs> showing, showing my age, we'd say Obama today, but there were no computers. But, you know, they had maps, they had where everybody who worked in the factory, where their relatives lived in Puebla, where their, <laughs> <whoo>. <laughs> And I remember sitting around that campfire late at night and turning to an elderly gentleman from the village, and uh, he listened to the whole discussion. I would say he was 
maybe I was younger and he looked older, but probably my age now. <laughs> but I said to him, I said, so what do you think this contract means? What do you think this means that they now have their own union? And he said, and it was interpreted for me, he said, this sounds like this is very, very good news for the women because they now have power. It sounds like it's very, very bad news for the men in this village. 